Acts 14, 8 through 20. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looked intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well. Said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostle... When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Thank you so much for standing for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all. I am so grateful to be with you. This is not a part of anything planned, but I love Matt reading scripture right there. I've seen him do it twice today. He executed it flawlessly. But what's even more impressive, and I mean this for any member who comes up here and reads scripture, you are always welcome to go ask them this question. Not publicly, privately. Hey, man, tell me how Jesus transformed your life. Dude, I love each week seeing trophies of grace, reading the truth of God's word. You're invited to see how God is mercifully in spite of us, not because of us. He is changing people's lives here all the time. So Matt looks forward to seeing you after service down front. I'm just kidding, dude. That will give him a panic attack. All right, hey, I do want to start out, though, by just sharing a little vision here at the Springs of some things myself, we as the elders, the leaders here, we care about. We end our sermons with this line, I hope you have a great week of worship. Now, regardless of what you think of worship, worship is something we really care a ton about. That's why you guys also care a ton about how, when, where, why you get to worship. That's why one of the things that we as leaders take really seriously is people's concerns, criticisms, critiques. Let's just call it feedback on their experience of joining us for a Sunday gathering or an event throughout the week, whether that be in person or at home online. And don't get me wrong, some of y'all, your superpower is constructive criticism. (laughs) So we hear you. We welcome you. I want to go with you over like some of the top five to six things that we hear. You may have never felt these, or you may have thought about these this morning as you walked in. First thing, parking, parking. Depending on what time you get here, and none of y'all show up on time, okay? Parking, especially in a culture like New Braunfels, can be forever. And what I mean by forever is like, you got to walk two blocks, maybe cross a street, and there is a, this is getting a little ridiculous, And then you have perhaps a little one. You got to get a little one to kids ministry. So parking can be a concern. Let's say you even then have a kiddo. You got to check a kiddo in and you come into kids ministry check in. Well, that can take you four minutes, four minutes amount of time. And then, and then you endure that line. And then you come and if you're brave enough to stand in the coffee line, how fast can you get the coffee? Does the Keurig go as fast as you want? And then even though we have more creamers than a local coffee shop trying to launch as an entrepreneur, You're still like, they do not have soy vanilla latte, basic, I need what I want. But I get it. Or then you come into the service, and I'm not taking shots at you. It's not passive aggressive. (laughs) Uh, And then you come into the service, and don't get me wrong. We sing too much, we sing too little. 
We sing too loud. We sing too quiet. The song choices are too modern. We do too many hymns. And then the sermon. The sermon is too long. The sermon is too short. John is too loud. John is not loud enough. I don't know if anybody really thinks that, right? <laughs> you come at communion and you love it. You're like, we should give more time to communion. Well, we should give less time. Everyone has preferences and opinions. Now, now, hear me say, those aren't even necessarily wrong. And again, as leaders, we care a ton about these. Why? Remember how I started it with, we hope you have a great week of worship. Whether you mean this or not, we want you as a follower of Jesus, if that's you, to live a life of worship. Like worship, real plainly defined, means adoration. Adoration. We want you to adore God. So when folks come here, in addition to the rest of your life, we want to smooth out those rough edges to where, to use this language, we can remove distractions for those who are seeking it can come with a heart of clear worship. Sometimes we can honestly think like, man, how are we doing this so wrong to where people seem to have a really hard time connecting or worshiping here? Then I had the gift, the privilege the blessing of going somewhere. And honestly, my standards for the distractions that people will tolerate in order to have a heart of adoration or worship, it kind of changed, to be honest. I want to show you a picture of a place, and I want to know if you guys have ever heard of this place. Any of y'all ever heard of that place? Right, anybody here having to go to Texas A&M or a fan of it? Okay, just a few of you. Some of y'all went to UT or other schools and you hate this illustration already. Hey, remember, I told you, you can like have critiques and feedback, like send us an email. Don't email me, but send us an email, right? I had the blessing of going there yesterday. And you know what I realized? You know what I realized? People are, <laughs> people, someone was like, it's awesome. <laughs> people don't have a worship problem. They just seem fine at, let's think about parking, right? You got to park a couple blocks away or you got to like cross the street. I dragged a four-year-old a mile to that stadium. I was like, dude, you are lucky. Get in there, buddy. You come and you wait for kids check-in. I don't know if you've ever been there. And I'm sure this is like, you, you could equate it with like, um, like there's Texas A&M or, or maybe you're here and you're like a UT fan, right? UT fan, okay. Well, I, I've heard it said being a fan of UT, it's at least more biblical, right? Why? You worship a golden calf. Right? Yeah. So regardless of where your idolatry lies in the college football world, and then some of y'all, like, you would never care this much about college football, but man, the amount of money you will pay to see Taylor Swift eras is ridiculous. You get what I'm saying? So we all have our thing, but you walk into the stadium and literally they get there. There's thousands of people and you're pressing together like cattle. It's like 10 yards wide and you walk this massive staircase. I'm walking and I'm thinking, kids ministry ain't that bad. Like that check-in system, that's not that bad. My kids losing a fit and you got to like go and like buy them off with like candy and hot dogs as they are enduring the heat of the sun. And all of a sudden I'm waiting to spend $97 on one hot dog and two Dasani. And all of a sudden I'm like, coffee line's looking pretty good, right? You show up, the songs they play, y'all, there is like, and I don't know them, my wife's an Aggie, I'm not. There's like in-house songs and chants they practiced them the night before, right? Imagine if we were like, hey guys, we're gonna have a Sunday morning service and then come back in the evening. You'd be like, this is ridiculous. They're going all night. They do it at midnight. It's insane. They come, they have these hearts of adoration. It honestly got me thinking, I don't know if the issue is so much, there's too many distractions but it's more what has the center of your, and let's be honest, my affection. I had a wonderful time at the game. But to use this language, what happens when it becomes more than just a game? And I get it, many of us here, college football, that's not our thing. Like basically saying my life is too busy to spiritually lead my family, but you will consecrate, which means to sacrifice and devotion towards easily six hours a weekend for college or professional sports. But you're right. You're too busy to spiritually lead yourself so you can lead others. Or you're like, college football again, John, not me. Okay, okay, your altar might not be Cal Stadium. 
Your altar might be like on your phone, you're on Amazon, and the place you worship is swipe right for buy now on Amazon. Or maybe you, you're like, no, man, Amazon doesn't have me. But that evening news broadcast describing the political leader of your choice, the rally, the attendance, the most recent poll, you know what it has? The heart of your affection. I want to put before you this idea of have a great week of worship. I want you to know, I think we're all made to worship. Telling you, the Aggie Stadium seats 102, 723,000 people. And I think every seat was full yesterday. There was one common vision of worship. If we're all made for it, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, the question for me is when do good things become ultimate or bad things? To say it differently, what do we do when worship goes wrong? Well, what do we do when perhaps everyone's seeking to experience the divine, the transcendent, supernatural reality? There must be a maker. This longing for a higher power. What do we do when that longing perhaps gets redirected, misses its mark, misses its mark, and instead of authentic Christianity, we end up in false idolatry? What do we do when worship goes wrong? And now again, I want to clearly define, when I say worship... What I mean here, and this is how Oxford Dictionary defines it, adoration of a deity. Adoration of a deity. I'm just saying adoration. And then let's say idolatry, because if you didn't grow up in church, that's that's like a strange word. It's a confusing word. So let me define that as well, too. Oxford Dictionary says extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. You know what I saw yesterday? Extreme admiration, love, or reverence. In his book, recently passed away, pastor, author, teacher, Tim Keller, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, he describes idolatry. He takes this, diction, or this definition, he personalizes it a little bit more. He says this is what an idol is. An idol is anything more fundamental than God to your happiness meaning in life or identity. Anything more fundamental to God, to your happiness, meaning in life or identity. So to take a step back, is worship, according to Oxford Dictionary, is worship a Christian thing? No. Worship's a human thing. Now, regardless of whether or not you believe in God, is idolatry even then a Christian thing? No. No. To whether if you are here, the reality of the idolatry of your heart and mine is meant to be exposed. Because here's what's true. When worship that's meant for your maker misses its mark, you know where you and I end up? In idolatry. In seeking to live the truth, to know the truth, when I settle for instead my will, my way, my truth, I end up in a place of lies. How do you know if the posture of your heart of adoration has taken you to a place of devotion or deception? Or maybe you're like me, and if you're honest, you're a blend of both. Where in your singleness, you are resenting the privilege you have to be with God today because your happiness orients around the future one day potential spouse. You gave your today in the hope of a different tomorrow. Again, in the church, we'll often say idolatry is when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing. When when your career matters so much to you that you have normalized working 60 hours skipping little league games when you can. But in reality, you would say you're just too busy to have a healthy marriage. 
Do you see the exchange that we made? Do, do you see how so many of us, we have an idol in our heart that holds us captive. We want it to bring us life, but it holds us captive. What do we do when worship goes wrong? Whether they be in my heart or in the heart of others, and what is at stake? Is there actually a God who your sense of admiration and adoration can find a home in? And you cannot just experience glory to you, but you could actually live communion with him. Is it possible? And what are the ways that you and I perhaps settle for the counterfeit versions? Don't get me wrong. The counterfeit versions, they feel good short term. But they are devastatingly costly long term. That's why I'm so excited. We are going to be in the book of Acts. We're continuing through this series if you've been with us, here's what we've seen. We've seen these two Christian leaders, Paul and Barnabas, going from city to city. They basically have this message that simply Jesus will change everything. He's not who you think he is. He's better than you can imagine. And knowing him not only will secure an eternity, it'll change you, but you will become a man or a woman of dignity, security, joy, peace. It's not just about later on then, but also right now. It's this crazy message. But they've gone city to city, and we've seen this movement. They come, and the kingdom of God expands. It grows. It's beautiful. But as there's the expansion of the kingdom, we always see what's following it is an opposition to its king. As light grows, darkness moves against it. Now, if you've been with us for the past few weeks, the way they've been sharing this message, they've been sharing it to an audience, and that audience had a predominant culture, just like us, perhaps even a predominant ethnicity, just like us. And that for them was a highly Jewish or Jewish-influenced culture. So they've been speaking to a crowd with this message. You're waiting for the Jewish Messiah. I know him. I've met him. And then they try to root that argument and message in Jewish scripture. Well, today, we're going to see their audience. There's little to no Jewish influence. Their audience is, is Gentile, not Jew. And we're going to see them take this never-changing message to a totally changed people. But at the core of this, what we're going to discover is what do Paul and Barnabas do when worship goes wrong. The idols of their day, the idols of their day, we'll see, Zeus, Hermes, they may not be the literal idols that we face today, but the idolatry in the heart of men and women is tragically alive and well in me, as well as perhaps you. N.T. Wright, famous Christian author, theologian, he says this, when humans cease to worship God, they do not worship nothing. They worship anything. So when it comes to this question of worship, it's not really one of if we worship, but who or what we worship, and then to what degree do we give it our religious zeal? Whether that be the future spouse you want or the current spouse you resent, the living vicariously through your kids' academic or athletic achievement, to the destructive coping habits that you hide in the darkness of your own life that keep you caged, to those of us who've realized you can make the local church in religious performance its own idol. We are all seeking communion with our maker what do we do when we at times are tempted and miss our way? What's the way out? If you have a Bible, turn to me to Acts chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 8 through 20. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat back in front of you. You can find this text on page 868. Page 868. 
But again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 20. Again, we're trying to just resolve this question. What do we do when the worship goes wrong? What, what do we do when others or ourselves seeking connection with God, we settle for a broken deception and false idolatry? My hope is if we just look at the text, we'll be able to understand it. And then from understanding, we'll be able to really say, what does God mean for you and me in it? Let's start in verse 8. I'm going to go 8 through 13, and then we'll pause. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use a seat. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. He sprang up, began walking. When the, cloud, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us, in the likeness of men, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought the oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So you and I, we're trying to understand this text. Why? We want to figure out how do we actually have a heart of worship? If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, you're going to get to contrast here. Everyone worships. You just get to see what are the costs when you worship the wrong person, or as I would say, the wrong God. But as we look at the beginning of this text, here's what's clear. Paul and Barnabas, they arrive in a whole new city, but they are preaching the exact same message. They think things are going well. Little do they know what awaits. Now, each week, we've been trying to orient ourselves geographically. So here's a map where we can see their whole journey, right? So if you look at kind of the top center, last week, if you're with us, we talked about Paul and Barnabas ministering in Iconium. Now they've gone south. It's approximately 58 miles there to Lystra. Now this is in modern day Turkey, modern day Turkey, but they arrive to this city. Paul comes, there's little to no Jewish influence. So normally when they go to the synagogue, there's no synagogue to go to. So he's likely gone to the middle of a city center, maybe even like a smaller, like Acropolis, like this communal gathering place. And he's standing there and he's telling them, I know who the unknown God is. We'll talk more about that in chapters to come. He's telling them, I know the true God. Now as he's talking, people are going by, they're passing him, they don't care, some do, but there's a crippled man in the dirt. Now this is an honor-shame culture. To be a crippled man in the dirt is to be an unforgettable and untouchable and unwanted. This man had no dignity, Likely, no money. If he were to go anywhere, he either crawled through the dirt or people would have to touch him and then drag him certain places. The one who is forgotten by all in this moment is the first one by faith to see God clearly. It does not matter who you are, whether you are looking for God or not, he is looking for you. This crippled man Paul looks at in a supernatural way that I honestly don't fully understand. It seems like Paul has this like spiritual gift where by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can look into this man's heart, soul, mind and see the supernatural realm. This man believes. He sees this man's faith on the ground, the dirt. And he says, get up. Now, this is a miracle. This is shocking. This man had been there since birth. He's likely known, walked past, everyone has looked down on. And all of a sudden, the village beggar, the man broken and shattered, is healed. The crowd is stunned. This would be the moment where you might think Paul and Barnabas like, wow, God's going to do it again. They saw cities change in Antioch and Pisidia. They saw cities change in Iconium. And now they're here. It's like, oh. It's only beginning. The city's intrigue and interest builds. Little do they know the crowd is speaking in their native language, Lyconian. And instead of perhaps growing in an interest in their God, they've instead come to worship Paul and Barnabas as false gods. Zeus and Hermes, part of their pantheon of gods. Do you see the striking tragedy in irony of this moment. Paul is there with Barnabas risking everything to tell them there's the true God. And the whole crowd hearing a message, Jesus is true. 
is doubling down in believing a lie. This city has no problem with worship. This city wants to worship. These people are made to worship. The issue is not if they worship, but who or what it's placed in. And again, when you miss your mark in God, you settle in broken idolatry. Now, what would you do if people just started to praise, worship, or celebrate you? Just kind of lean in for a moment. I wouldn't. I would never do that. No, totally I would. Let's see what they do. Continue with me in 14 through 17. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things. That's his language for their idols. Vain things, worthless, empty, futile, vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, God allowed all the nation to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So again, you got to come back to the moment. Paul and Barnabas, likely screaming from a city center, having seen the miraculous transformation of a man, and then maybe some others coming to believe, think the city is like coming and like maybe God is real. They are appalled to realize instead of coming to worship their God, these two men are now being worshiped as gods. That's why they have this Jewish form of lament. They rip their clothes in contrition and grief. That's a sign of blasphemy. What that means, you are rejecting the true God. You are believing a lie. And then Paul in that moment, he launches straight into a sermon where he proclaims, I'm just a man. I know one worth bowing to. It's not me. You see how he's not critiquing the fact they want to bow. He's critiquing where they bow. And then he comes and he calls their gods vain things, worthless idols, and then he contrasts it with the true living God. He launches into an argument basically saying, hey, let's take your pantheon of false gods and compare them and contrast them with the true God. He gives God like five distinguishing characteristics at a high level. The first one, as we've discussed, he calls God living. Right here, before this crowd ever even understands the reality of the resurrection, he's laying the groundwork that his God is not dead. The second thing he says is true. True. All false idols promise something short term. They steal long term. Instead of giving you the intimacy, the glory, the security that you might want, that I might want, it's left feeling like vanity, meaningless. If I could just get that next relationship, if I could just get that house, that job, if I could just go to this school, if I could just be friends with these people. Every form of idolatry is seeking to change the external without God allowing to transform your inner world into a world of love or shalom. We trade intimacy for idolatry and I, when I do it, end up in vanity. So he's living, he's true, he's powerful. See, there was no Greek God that created everything. Paul in this moment is mocking their view of the power of gods, and he's saying, my God did it all. Your gods did some. My God did it all. And then he even comes to say his God is merciful. See, they'd never heard of this Jewish Messiah and God. Now, their gods were fickle, insecure, capricious, like they change at any moment. So for them, if they don't honor correctly, the gods might lash out at them. That's actually part of the reason why they're worshiping Paul and Barnabas. This region had a myth to it. The myth went this way. Zeus and Hermes had once visited this region. No one showed them hospitality besides one family. So what did Zeus do in response to this lack of hospitality when I am God? Killed everyone with a flood. They're so quick to call the priest. Why? They fear their God just killing them. 
This is where Paul's argument's changing. He's saying, no, no, no. Even though you've never heard of our God, he's come in love, not your death. He's merciful. He wants you to know him even though you've never heard. And then he even roots it in he's kind. To this agrarian society, he comes and he says, you, you know who's gifted you the rains? My God. You know who's gifted you the seasons that lead to the harvest? My God. You know who has gifted you the food to where you feast with your family? My God. And he says, you know who has gifted you gladness or joy? My God. See, their gods often took. He's coming with an argument. Not only is God living, true, more powerful, but he is a God who gives. He's contrasting vanity with this God comes in glory. But then the text ends. How do they go? The Apostle Paul next to Jesus, he is the most effective missionary to have ever walked the face of the planet. Like when he preached by the power of the Holy Spirit, cities changed and he steps up, man. He meets the moment. He puts it in their context and he says, no, 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 this is what's true. You're believing a lie. How does it go? Let's pick it back up in 18. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Paul, now we don't know to what degree he did this, okay? Because this Gentile audience, this is for the Bible nerds out there, which we're huge fans of. This Gentile audience has no idea of an Old Testament sacrificial system, okay? But right here, he's telling them, no, no, no. You don't live a life offering sacrifices so God will accept and love you. God came as a sacrifice, so you can feel accepted and loved by him. Do you see the irony of the moment? His message is scarcely keeping them from. He's telling them, God loves you with a sacrificial love. Believe in him. He loves you with a sacrificial love. And they are coming before Paul and Barnabas, and they are slaughtering animals in sacrifice. Animals are dying as he's pleading with, no, no, you don't get it. Their blood does nothing, nothing. I know one whose blood covers everything. Wrong sacrifice, wrong God, vanity, glory and intimacy awaits. They don't care. And then, and then, imagine how depressing that would have been, by the way. The Apostle Paul, it had to have been a moment of realizing, I can invite, I can invite, but only God can change the heart. And then, almost like an enemy comes in from stage left, like in a play. Former Jewish leaders that Paul and Barnabas had gone up against in the past cities of Antioch and Pisidia and Iconium, cities that had run him out of town, cities that threatened to kill him, they've walked at least 100 miles to hunt him down. What do they do? They come and they connect with the crowd. Now, they have a problem before them. Why? The crowd loves Paul and Barnabas. They're literally making sacrifices to them. But in some way, they take this crowd and they flip it, and the crowd goes from making sacrifices to them to stoning Paul. The one that before, animals were likely dying at his feet. They drag him out of the city and leave his body for dead as he dies at their feet. What's the last place where we saw a reference to being in or outside the city? It was that priest who ran from Zeus's temple. We, we can't know for sure, but it seems as if this mob drags him out, leaves him there for dead, and they think he is dead. Like these Jewish leaders have traveled from Antioch. They have come from Iconium. Don't you think they're gonna like check? They're at least gonna look from a distance to see as he is on the ground, body shattered, broken, and bleeding. Hey Amen. I don't see his chest rising and falling. He's gone, or he'll die from that. And they leave. You see the striking contrast of what happens? Paul starts this text standing, preaching life to a crippled man. Paul ends this text shattered in the dirt that the crippled man has now left. 
and for preaching life. He is left for dead. This city had no problem with worship. But we have problems when worship ends up in all the wrong places. You know what's rough, though? The disciples will come around Paul, and who knows, it's likely the crippled man, Barnabas, and then others who came to believe. And they'll either pick him up and his body will limp back into the city for the night, or I don't know, maybe there's some miraculous healing. He like gets up and he walks into the city and the next day he will once again flee and he'll go to Derby. You know what he's gonna do in Derby? Spoiler alert, if you decide to come back next week, he's gonna keep preaching. It's striking how even when Paul and Barnabas are trying to be so faithful, you can do everything right and then things go so terribly wrong. This past week, I was working on my sermon from home and uh, I went, I took a break, I saw my wife, she gets a phone call and the person calling her was the preschool from my two-year-old Josie. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this, if you get a phone call from the preschool, of a two-year-old, they're not calling with good news. You know that immediately. Like, no one's calling and be like, Josie's valedictorian. That does not happen, all right? So immediately we know something's off. Taylor answers the phone. I see her like take this like ashen, sullen face. And I'm like, what's wrong? Is everything okay? And she just looks at me and she just goes as the teacher's there. She says, Josie bit a kid. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know about you, okay? We were imperfect, that's true, but we honestly, we kind of try with the whole parenting thing, all right? We're putting our best effort forward. Could it be more? I'm sure, but we're trying, right? In our house, we're really doing whatever we can. We're, we're not fans of biting. That's not like a school rule. That's like a home rule that she broke. Well, she's broken at home. And then it's school. So we're hearing this, and Taylor's immediately with the teacher, like, hey, I'm so sorry. Josie's old enough. She could say, I'm sorry. She can understand. She could say, will you forgive me? Hey, if there's a chance, I'd love to have Josie apologize to the other kid after class. We'll say sorry to the mom. I'll say sorry to the parents. Whoever's there, we'll say sorry to you. We want this reconciliation to come. The teacher's like, okay, hey, sounds good. The teacher's then saying, hey, I just need you to know if she bites again, she bites again, we'll have to send her home for the day, right? That's called out of school suspension. Yeah, yeah, it gets better. And they're like, and if it happens again, we might have to expel her. Anyone else had their preschooler threatened to be expelled this week? No, nobody else hitting their parenting goals? No, you're, you're not living, right? They come, Taylor goes to pick up, right? All right, how do we talk to Josie? How do we reason with a two-year-old? All that. Got to make it age appropriate. Taylor goes to open the door. She's got this, all right, Holy Spirit, let's have reconciliation. Let's do all this. Let's train. Teacher meets her, and she's like, Josie bit a kid again. Dude. Again, we're not cool with that. We're not perfect. But what do you do when you're trying to do everything right, but things just seemingly go so wrong. Paul and Barnabas in this text are almost like a textbook for faithfulness in ministry. They're doing everything seemingly right. Like they're faithful from city to city. They preach the gospel. Paul even has this like supernatural faith to look into another man and be like, you have faith. You get it. There's this miraculous healing. The city the city gets deceived and they start worshiping Paul and Barnabas. What do these men do? Again, such examples of faithfulness. They don't wait for a moment and bask in the, no, no, please don't tell me. Please don't tell me how great I am. They rip their clothes and they run screaming into the city saying, stop. After that, Paul launches beautifully into a cross-cultural sharing of the gospel falls on deaf ears. This man who's seen cities transformed, the next thing that happens, other men will come and turn the city against them. He'll be left for dead. How can you try and do everything right 
and things seemingly go so wrong. This city wanted to worship. They had a longing for God or gods. But what should they have done when worship goes so wrong? What should we do when worship goes so wrong? Because again, let's be real. If you're a follower of Jesus, our goal is to help others connect with the true source of divinity, God. But what happens when they miss their way and settle for lying idolatry? We all have a longing to worship. People are constantly searching for God, the transcendent. But so often, we go looking in all the wrong places. What are we supposed to do, church, to care for those? And then if we're honest, what are we supposed to do when really this problem hits a little closer to home? In our cultural moment, different than a time of offering sacrifices to Zeus and Hermes, but similar in in offering sacrifices to the altar of sports, career, family, money, sex, power, ambition, pride, How are we supposed to seek truth when we are tempted to settle for lies? I want to share with you a principle that's true just about the Christian faith that you see it carried out in this text, but this text, it comes with a strike reality of the consequences can be real. Like this principle speaks to what does it take for Christianity to flourish? And when I say that, I really mean corporately, like in a group, in a community, in a family, and I most especially mean in an individual's soul and heart. What does it take for Christianity, real faith, to flourish? Because for that to flourish, oftentimes things must be dug up and rooted out. And then, to use the language of Paul later on in his ministry, put to death. For Christianity to flourish, you see this all throughout. Idolatry must be fought. Idolatry must be fought. Why are Paul and Barnabas in Lystra? They are there to combat idolatry, anything that orients itself at the center of well-being, purpose, identity, or meaning, besides God. They are seeking to replace this idolatry with real Christianity, which is this. It's not just eternity. It is intimacy, security, dignity, power, a transformed life, not just waiting for heaven. Don't just wait for heaven. Live his way now is a different invitation. We see this, them combating it. It's why they go to the city in the first place. We see this in combating it. That's why when they're worshiped as false gods, they rip them up off the ground and then tear their clothes. It's why Paul calls their gods vain things. It's why he proclaims real truth is they are dying as they follow their truth. For Christianity to flourish corporately, as a society, as a city, as a church family, as a family dinner table or a community of singleness in a house, for it to flourish individually in your soul. The war is on. Idolatry must be fought. Now, I want to share with you three ways that as followers of Jesus, idolatry must be fought. The first one is really more of a realization. It's simply this. You must believe that altars are alive and well today. You must believe that altars of false worship are alive and well today. Don't get me wrong. This text shows that they made false gods, like there's Zeus, there's Hermes, there's a priest coming, sacrifices being laid out. Historically, false gods were absolutely images made from wood or perhaps metal or graven. You would attend a physical temple to a place of worship. Hear me say, that may not be your experience here in central Texas, but at the same time, you have to acknowledge altars are alive and well. While people may not bow in physical temples, People absolutely bow in their hearts to the idolatry of the political party, to the idolatry of materialism, to the idolatry of their religious performance thinking, if I do more of this, I'll be more impressive to them or to God. Idolatry is alive and well. I can remember when I became a Christian, I first had to realize idolatry had to be fought. 
That happened in two ways for me, two ways. First thing is, the first thing that had to get rid of was false belief. You could call this like salvation, or really you could say my way of thinking, right? I can remember the day I went from thinking, I need to try harder to be better, to realizing by faith, I'm actually loved regardless of how messed up I am. And I was messed up. That was the first form of idolatry that God had to deal with and had to be fought against. But do you know that that's not when idolatry stopped in my life? I remember real quickly, I'm a new Christian. The next thing for me, the next idol he really went after, I'll use the word debauchery. I don't know what word you would put. For me, that typically looked like I would grab a bottle, I would check out, I would drink in such excess because I wanted to escape and cope and then be able to do whatever I wanted without a guilty conscience. And I can remember him really beginning to address my relationship with alcohol and say, man, this has more of a hold on you than you do on it. So I go from like idolatry of false faith, wrong thinking, to now he wants to transform idolatry of my heart, wrong living. He starts at a level of debauchery, which you might be like, wow, John, I don't have that problem. I'll pray for you. Great. The next level he cut to, I can remember even when it was sobriety, then trying to escape instead with a sense of not feeling enough, so escaping through pornography. That'd been part of my life since fifth grade. There I am, a young adult, still enslaved to this thing. And he goes from one layer of idolatry to another. Now here's the thing, by God's grace, going to war, freedom came, victory, hope, newness of life. And then I began to realize, you know what came next after that? Gluttony. Gluttony. How I don't think I needed the six pack to escape. I could go get that bucket of fried chicken and I'll get a same or different dopamine hit that way. I can remember reading a book where the author had a premise of talking about how many pastors would come and say God freed them of pornography while they were enslaved to food and gluttony. I remember the Holy Spirit right then was like, hey man, you know what sometimes you allow to orient your happiness around? It's not me. Have you ever realized? Probably not, you're better people than me. I can be sinful depending on what food choice I make based on my emotional and spiritual state. These are my problems. But guess what? You know what the next idol to come was? Really, at the base of it, a sense of identity. How do I find identity in family, what my wife thinks, what a church thinks, what, other, what I think? Achievements. How do I find identity? Like, I got to be like the best dad, the dad who coaches and disciples and takes them camping as well as gets to buy awesome stuff for Christmas. And then maybe if I can pay for college... How do I become the best husband to where I can come home, I'm fully present, but also I can afford the date night at like the cool places? <laughs> you see the path of idolatry, how rooted in my heart it was? Here's the thing, man. I don't necessarily need Zeus or Hermes to bow to the wrong place. I'm made to bow, and so are you. The question is, do you bow before a God of glory or idols that ultimately result in vanity? If you want to deal with the idols out there, church, you must first reckon with the idols in here. So often followers of Jesus point to the problems there, and Jesus is like, whoa, 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 they don't even believe in me. You believe in me. Why don't you deal with me and let me deal with them? Hey, John, why won't you let me come for what captures your heart? Killing idols is costly business. This is why it's often preached of, but rarely lived. I, we, must be a people who believe altars are real, alive and well. What's the second way that we got to learn to fight idolatry? The second way we got to learn to fight idolatry, if altars are real. The second thing that you really see modeled in this text is Paul and Barnabas go to share the truth of Jesus with them. They take their truth, but they share it in a way that the crowd understands. That's called contextualizing the message. I'll say that again. They take something they know, they've learned, but they share it in a way the crowd understands. They contextualize it. Anybody here heard of the term Christianese? 
Christianese. If not, okay, I'll introduce it to you. It's like language that we Christians can speak. Then we talk about it with people who are not Christians. They look at us like you're a weirdo because we are. Like this is stuff like, hey, how's your walk? Other people are like, what are you doing? Like trying to get 10,000 steps? And we're like, no, I really meant soul, marriage, kids, all that type of stuff. Oh, why don't you just say that? Or it's stuff like you go to share your faith with somebody and you're like, hey, do you know that Jesus Christ is the sacrificial atonement, God's propitiation for your sins so that justification by faith through an understanding of his death, burial, resurrection, and in a future glorified form with him in a glorified body in new heavens and new earth, if you believe in him by faith and faith alone, by grace alone, and scripture alone, and truth alone, you could be saved. Would you like to believe? They're like, what just happened? <laughs> Why? It's, it's us taking them into our world. We understand our world. Well, they don't even believe in our God. Therefore, they will not understand our world. One of the things I also learned at that Aggie game, uh, home field advantage really matters. Home field, okay, you guys might have known that because here's, I, I grew up playing a lot of sports. Here's what's true. A good sports team should be able to win at home, okay? A great sports team can win away, can win when they're a visitor. Why? When you're at home, man, it's home field advantage. The crowd is for you. They all get it. They're on your team. They support you. Hey, church, can I tell you something? We have lost home field advantage. This culture is increasingly turning away from our God. We have to stop trying to drag people into our world and instead seek to learn to meet them in theirs. That's why the Apostle Paul, again, he doesn't come saying, hey, you're looking for the Jewish Messiah. I know him. Why? They'd be like, I'm not looking for the Jewish Messiah. The Apostle Paul doesn't come say, hey, let me tell you about Father Abraham and your connection to him, or, or let me tell you about these Old Testament prophets and their verses. That's exactly what he did in Antioch and Iconium. No, because if he'd said that, they'd be like, I don't care about your scriptures. He instead uses logic and reasoning to where we could come and as someone in their hardship, we could look at someone who doesn't believe, like, hey, you don't, don't need to worry. I don't know if you've ever read Romans 8. They probably haven't. And then we cruelly pronounce over them, God works everything together for the good of those who love them and are called according to his purpose. So hope you love him and hope it works out. Instead, you have to be willing and ready to meet them in the, hey, man, if you say your God is love, where was he when I watched my mother die of cancer at 15? If you say your God is kind and his way leads to life, how, how is following him better than denying my internal sense of sexuality? If you say he's good, how come so many of his people seem so cruel? Church, we lost home field advantage. We got to enter into their world and love them, just like Jesus came, leaving the throne room of heaven and entering this world, just like Paul and Barnabas did entering Lystra. So what do we do to fight idolatry? Altars are alive and well. The second, you got to put truth in a way they understand it, contextualize. Third, you must believe this is a matter of life and death. You must believe this is a matter of life and death. And you got to wonder, am I saying that? Is that like hyperbole? Is that exaggeration? Look at, look at the text. Again, Paul starts at standing. He ends up stoned. And not like the hippie, like, stoned. Yeah, some of y'all get that. But the like. He actually did it. There was actually a Christian that was that brave. There was actually a man who said, you could kill me. How do you think the crippled man felt? Where the message he came to bring and gave him life, he now watches a man die for. And then that's his reckoning of this new God. Wait, wait, the God who saved me is the God who allowed that? Yeah, man. Yeah. Paul gave life so others won't know death. But then here's the second layer of this. You gotta believe it's a matter of life and death. 
When you come for someone's idols, do not expect idols to go quietly into the dark. When you come after what is sacred to other people, when other people come after what is sacred to you, don't expect them to let that go by without a fight. This whole crowd turns and leaves this man dying. This is why even followers of Jesus, the idols of your heart, these are the things the other people that know you and love you can't talk about. Or for them to talk about it, they gotta like walk on eggshells and they feel like they're like doing a tightrope walk no matter how hard they try. This is the fact that you have found so much identity in your physical appearance. The fact that you are up to your eyes in credit card debt because you're chasing a sense of happiness through accumulation and wealth. This is the fact that you say that you want to follow Jesus, but your life does not orient Jesus at all. You offer like a Sunday morning once a month as a guilt offering to God that you don't even really feel loving with. But when people talk about it, immediately you become a spiritual lawyer. Who are you to say to me? How dare they? I would never connect to church community and accountability. That's ridiculous. Will you let God kill your idols? Easy to preach, hard to live. We are meant to be a people who live but be doers and not just hearers only. So what are the three things you gotta do for Christianity to flourish and idolatry to be fought? Altars are alive and well out there and in here. You gotta learn to put truth in a context people can understand. And third, this is a matter of life and death. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are and what you have done. I thank you for the gift of your word. Show us the depth of its meaning even now as we come and remember you in communion. Amen. I'd like to invite you at this time, if you're a follower of Jesus and you miss the elements, you can find them at the sides or at the back. I just want to take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, if you're a Christian, and I want to give you time in prayer. Prayer of examination and prayer of confession. Where you simply say this, if you're willing, if you're brave, Holy Spirit, show me my idols. What does my heart orient around more than you? What competes for my affection? Show me my idols. And then as he shows you, and I believe he will, simply say to him, I renounce these and I choose you. We take the next 20 to 30 seconds simply praying this prayer. Holy Spirit, show me my idols in a posture of confession. Christian, I want you now to take 20 seconds, and before we take the bread, before we take the blood, I want you to allow God to tell you in the midst of your idolatry, you are forgiven, you are loved, you are known. Ask the Spirit to show you those things. Take the next 10 to 20 seconds to yourself. Lord, we love you. You are God. You are the one that we want. You are the one that we worship. I thank you that even when we try to do it all right and it can seemingly go so wrong, we still have you. You are enough. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that for people here who don't know you, who have understandably made their God themselves through, through money, power, position, status, anything, what others think of them, whether that be the high schooler paralyzed by wishing they were more popular, the college kid trying to find the right place to fit in or the right job or the right future, the young adult wandering through life or the empty nester, we can all miss you, but you are who we are after. So would you come? 
and show us how your way is better. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.